Welcome to Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered with Perry Clark. This program looks at mental health from unique perspectives and shows you how to manage your life by finding the knots that help you and stay away from the ones that could be a disadvantage. Now, here is your host, Perry Clark. Hello all, welcome back to Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered. This is Perry Clark, licensed marriage and family therapist here with you. And I want to remind everyone that this podcast is for entertainment and educational purposes only. This does not count as a session with a licensed mental health professional. Please seek out a mental health professional in your area to work on your personal and more unique issues. So today, uh, I'm going to up front that we're recording this in August. And so July has been a very interesting month. So I got invited to go to San Diego Comic-Con. Now, as a longtime geek, it's one of those dream meccas to go to. And I get to finally take it off my bucket list. And I was there at, not just as a attendee, but also as a presenter. And I was on two panels. And our guest today was one of the ones was on that pa- one of the panels with me. And uh, we're going to talk very much about an interesting series that we were focusing on, as well as the panel itself. So today's guest is Robert Rice. Robert is a co-producer and actor in the new horror series Demon Hunters on Here TV. He also appeared on CBS, Fox, and Comedy Central, and performs with his barbershop quartet, The Accidentals, in several television episodes, or television projects. Robert is co-founder of the Freaky Fight Funny Films, which is dedicated to fostering inclusive genre work. Robert, welcome to Untying Knots. Thank you for having me, Barry. It's nice to see you again. (laughs) You as well. So as I ask everyone, how did you get here? Oh, how did I get here? Um, well, I started in entertainment as a musical theater actor. Um, and going way back, I actually met my husband in Albany, New York, where I'm from. Mm-hmm. And uh, I auditioned for him. Mm-hmm. Um, so <laughs> take that as you will. It worked out. <laughs> um, and uh, and yeah, he lived in New York City. I moved down there, did the musical theater thing for a long time. And he had expressed that he wanted to move out to L.A. to pursue um, screenwriting. And mm-hmm. I... It's like, well, I can still act there too. So we've been in Los Angeles for about seven years doing the film TV thing. Um, I'm a member of SAG. I've been working in commercials and and TV and he's, you know, doing the screenwriting grind. And Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, basically Demon Hunter came about. um, We had talked a lot about creating our own content and we've had, we had a number of people tell us, you know, make your own stuff. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the new wave. Mm -hmm. Right. And so in 2019, Tim had been writing it since like 2017. Um, but in 2019, we did a crowdfunding campaign, um, raised $30,000, uh, shot it at the end of 2019. And then, you know, COVID happened. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then during COVID, we did all the posts. So editing and sound and the effects and all that and and put it through the festival circuit. And through that, we that's how we got distribution. Um, Here TV was at uh, the um, <clears throat> head of development for Here TV was at... Uh, a festival with us and um of course i can't think of the name of it but it was in palm springs and it's not the palm springs Inter- uh, cinema diverse was the name of it mm-hmm. and uh yeah he saw it and he was like hey let's talk about this and they <laughs> we signed a deal um to have it distributed so that led to comic-con and you and i meeting <laughs> exactly exactly so, how did it yeah. go? <laughs> oh, well, that's what's what sparked us in bringing us here now for for those who have been longtime listeners Robert is not necessarily BIPOC, um, yeah. but he's also falling under our standpoint of inclusion by also talking about being LGBT mm-hmm. and Demon Hunters. As I was just watching the first season before our interview um, this week, is also a very diverse BIPOC cast as well. Yeah. So I'm wondering what was sort of the energy behind that because I mean it could have easily gone fully non-BIPOC. I mean. Let's be frank. That's one of the biggest criticisms is about the whole Buffy verse. Well, yeah. And I mean, that is, that was actually our inspiration uh, because as you, you've seen Demon Hunter, so you know, it's very Buffy inspired. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, but what did we want to see more of from Buffy is less, well, I should say more of less white people <laughs> and more uh, queer people. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're like, well, we're making this. 
we raise the money. It's, you know, it's going to be what it is, but like, at least we can make it however we want to make it. So mm -hmm. we wanted it to reflect our, you know, our experience living in a big city because it does take place in Los Angeles. Like we have a diverse friend group that's not just diverse in terms of sexual identity or gender mm -hmm. identity, but also in terms of ethnicity. And, and we just kind of wanted to reflect that on screen because we're like, as I mentioned at Comic-Con, like if you have a show that has a queer person, it's usually one queer person mm -hmm. among like a whole bunch of straight people or, or maybe something else, but typically straight. And queer people usually have queer friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I realize that there are the cliches of like the insta white gays who are, all have like the same abs and the same face and they all hang out together. And that is absolutely a thing. Yes. The but, uh, and I, they don't like us either, Tim and I. So <laughs> <laughs> our group is a little more diverse, our friends. So uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. That's just what we wanted to reflect. We, we just really and we made a point of that in casting. Like when mm -hmm. we put out the breakdowns to cast, we were very... Um, specific with what we asked for um because we also learned through casting is that if you put all ethnicities which is very common mm -hmm. uh, people of people of color by bog like you, they just they won't submit because they're like a white person will get this mm -hmm. so we were deliberate mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and that and we had a good turnout we were really happy with our cast like everybody was wonderful um and yeah so that's what we were going for <clears throat> and i think one of the other amusing things in the story too is that essentially you only have so far as i can see one character who is identifying as straight yes and then you have at least a bi character and several other gay characters mm -hmm. and lgbt i'm not sure if you've got any um ace or such in there but not at the moment only five episodes so right. there's still time <laughs> there's still time to be able to build it there but that's a a, a one again example of creating it for ourselves and also ensuring that we can be the heroes too, just as mm -hmm. much. Yeah. Which was also one of the elements of what we were talking about at Comic-Con when mm -hmm. we were, we were both on the supporting for LGBT and neurodiverse panel. So let's talk a little bit about that. I, I admit that it was both a pleasure and honor to come down there and be on that panel, never expecting it to be on a panel at Comic-Con, just right. to be an attendee if I ever could be. So what was that experience like for you? Uh, well, well, um, so that was technically my second time, except the first time was during the Thanksgiving, uh, mm -hmm. like small version that they mm -hmm. did at Comic-Con. So I was like, wow, Comic-Con's not so crazy. <laughs> um, and it turns out it's actually quite, quite hectic. Um, <clears throat> yeah. But it, it was good. I mean, you know, it was a little bit, uh, you know, obviously a little bit bigger attendance than the previous one because we had less, you know, there were just less people allowed to come to the last one and it was Thanksgiving weekend. So I think most people mm -hmm. have other plans. Um, but this, it was nice. And I, I have to say, like, <clears throat> I mean, I've always I enjoyed, you know, meeting you and, and the other folks on the panel were on the panel last time, mm -hmm. or I should say the one at WonderCon. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just a great group of really interesting people with really interesting perspectives. And I don't, I mean, as a queer creator who embraces my queerness, um, in not only like what I do as an actor, but just like what my husband and I create, like, mm -hmm. you know, it's just so nice to be surrounded by people who are just authentically like sharing their experiences through their art or, you know, through their practice. And it's, I don't know, I just find it very invigorating whenever I do mm -hmm. something like that and see that I'm not alone in doing this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of people out there trying to make this happen. And, and we're actually inspiring people, which is, you know, that dad with his two kids there, like mm -hmm. that, that he really left an impact on me, like just his appreciation for what, what everyone was doing and the, you know, how we were trying in our small way to make the world a little bit better for his, his kids, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah. yeah, that was definitely one of those wonderful takes aways. Cause I know also in, for those of us who work in mental health, there's a way that a lot of work isn't always seen by people. Right now, mind mm -hmm. you, I have my druthers about how uh, all the Marvel cinematics things have been ca painting us as therapists and such. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is true. Um, either the more abrasive to the jokey to really ineffectionate. Um, but that standpoint of here having that thank you from them was definitely an ins inspiration. 
Yeah, uh, it was really nice. Which brings that aspect too to how do you feel that your work has also affected your mental health and let alone helped your mental health? Cool. Um, well, um, I don't know if I didn't share this at the most um, recent panel because it didn't really come up, but mm -hmm. the Tim, my husband and I have both lost a parent in the last year, in the last 12 months. And um, <clears throat> thank you. And already, um, you know, I've, I have generalized anxiety. That's something I learned um, mm -hmm. over, I mean, a little bit before the pandemic, um, but really obviously had to sit with, you know, during the pandemic. And so how do I say, like, it's, it's cathartic to make work. It's, it's, you know, it's cathartic to create um, it's, you know, it's stressful, but it keeps, keeps mm -hmm. my brain busy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it's also, there's something sort of comforting and just knowing that it, it means something to somebody, you know, like just mm -hmm. knowing that I'm making something it's inclusive. It's kind of out there um, just in the content. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but like, there are people who see that and think, Oh my God, I've really enjoyed that. And I really wanted to see this. And I wish I could see more of this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and like my mom was alive when we made it um, and was a huge, you know, it took, she took a long time to come around, but she, she came around and she was really passionate and championed everything that I did and we did. And so it saddens me that she never got to see it, but um, you know, I also know that she would be so proud, you know, so there is a, I do take a lot of, I do take pride in the mm -hmm. work that we've done and what we've created and on our, on our small scale, but like, you know, you have to start somewhere and, and it's, it's definitely just sort of helped give me like a, uh, my motivation, I guess, to like continue and to keep building and to keep pushing in that direction. Mm -hmm. And that's something I don't think often gets reminded about with any type of work, especially creative work of those connections that help foster it. Exactly. Exactly. So um, with that, uh, I would also wonder too, what do you think is encouraged by the work you've done with Demon Hunter too for mental health? Um, well, one thing that we experienced while we were in production mm -hmm. um, is we actually uh, we actually had many days on set where there were no straight white guys, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was interesting because. And, you know, hashtag not all straight white guys, but like mm -hmm. um, often the cliche of like film bros is like they tend to they just it just tends to be a little bit of like a competitive vibe um, mm -hmm. or like this sort of like it's not my fault. It's your, a lot of blame mm -hmm. gets thrown around. And obviously this is not always the case. Mm -hmm. um, and when you get onto like super like high end professional sets, like everyone's getting paid and they're happy and they usually aren't like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but um, you know, we would have these like days of shooting and it's like not a single person on set was a straight white guy. Um, and like the collaboration and the warmth and the, and the just like, let's put on a show feeling, mm -hmm. you know, from crew and cast and everyone else. Like it was just so, it was so inspiring. Like we would just come away from those days being like, oh my God, like this was such like everything about it was inclusive. And because it was so inclusive, it was so positive and just mm -hmm. so everyone felt embraced. Everyone felt heard. I mean, obviously like it's a film, like it's a low budget film production. We had issues. We had things we had to deal with. We had fires we had to put out. There were some personalities, you know, you deal with mm -hmm. some stuff, but like, um, but overall, like we just, it was so inspiring to just see like a whole bunch of people who are just trying to like, do this thing out here in this very difficult place to do it and like all mm -hmm. coming together <clears throat> and making it happen. And it just was like such a great feeling. And as far as mental health is concerned, it's just like, I felt very safe um, mm -hmm. in those environments, not just like as a queer person, but like everybody was just very comfortable with like whatever their mm -hmm. situation was mm -hmm. and like, being open about it, you know? So like it, uh, <laughs> if I was feeling anxious about something, it'd be like, I'm feeling anxious. I just need a moment, you know, mm -hmm. like it wasn't in a thing, you know, right. and that's, there's something very empowering about that. Well, yeah, especially after what we were talking about at the um, panel, it's also a sample of where no one on the cast had to mask 
or at least they didn't have to mask everything. They could mask what they not have to mask the sense of I'm being anxious or I'm feeling like I, this is not going to succeed or I'm tired of this grip giving me the eye. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we just like, I mean, obviously casting like was a little bit of a, a crapshoot because we were auditioned many mm-hmm. of the roles. Like we, we were able to cast some people we knew, um, but for like the lead roles, we had never met any of them before Mm -hmm. Um, so that was purely through casting um so you know you're always that's always going to be a bit of a guess because you only Mm -hmm. meet people through like an audition tape and then like in-person callback and you're like well i like you for the role i hope you're also a good person (laughs) because like there's only so much time to figure that out and so you kind of have to guess um but yeah i mean everyone really just you know was game Mm -hmm. and um and we had, you know, and, and as such, we had a really great experience overall. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just, I don't know, it was like, we want more of this. We want more environments like this where we can bring everybody to the table, you know, mm-hmm. just make our own damn table, right? <laughs> yeah, sometimes that is very much necessary because if they're not willing to share, it does not mean that there isn't still, shall we say, lumber out there to build our own table with. Exactly. And that also doesn't mean the uh, table has to be made out of lumber, it can be made out of cement, it can be made out of shells, it can be made out of many other things than just wood. Exactly. Exactly. Hmm. And we were scraping together materials to make this table. <laughs> and, <laughs> we'll you it it. and you and made it. And we it. did. We did. So, and so here we go. Um, so as I was watching it, uh, one of the characters that you had on there also already has a known connection follow to media like this that was daryl stevens who mm-hmm. played uh not wanting to throw spoilers around there anansi mm-hmm. so yes to land him uh you would be surprised at how how random that was well not even random but just like surprising so we had auditions for anansi so we actually know daryl through alan Braca. do you know q mm-hmm. alan Braca, who did like the eating out movies he directed them I have heard of them. I have not so, actually had a chance to watch them. And just oh, for those, okay. and just for those who are wondering, wanted to say Daryl Stevens. If you're familiar with a series called Noah's Ark, mm-hmm. it was supposed to be the sort of black version of uh, Sex in the City. He was the main character in Noah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now, well, although I think it's been canceled, he's he's on B Positive, which is on CBS. It's a sitcom. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he works. He works. But yeah. So. Daryl's amazing. And we met him through uh, Alan um, a a long time ago. And so we've just Mm -hmm. been sort of like acquaintances uh, through Twitter and stuff. But um, we had auditioned for that role and we had cast somebody. And then like three days before shooting, they dropped (laughs) Mm. just because they didn't want to do it anymore. Um, They didn't even give an excuse. They're just like, I don't want to do it. (laughs) Awesome. So we were panicking. This happened a lot, by the way, but Mm -hmm. uh, we were panicking. And I was like, Tim, you know what? You talk to Daryl. I know this is crazy, but why don't you just DM him and ask if he'd be willing to do it? (laughs) And he literally DM'd him and was like, Mm -hmm. would you have any interest in doing this? And he's like, well, send me the script. Um, And he's like, I've always wanted to play a villain and I never Mm -hmm. get to play villains. And he read the script and he liked it. And we're like, cool. (laughs) And so Daryl fucking Stevens. (laughs) did our did our 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 show um and that's literally how it happened it was a twitter deal <laughs> um, uh, and he could not have been sweeter or more professional um and he approved of the final product which is mm-hmm. means the world to us <laughs> so, <laughs> oh yes yeah, so i know when i was watching it's like wait you got teas in this so it's like oh that's a surprise yeah, that's our that's our that was our biggest get, I would say. Um because <clears throat> and it was again like so last minute, but he was a, he was such a sport. He deserves mm-hmm. all the work and all the kudos. <clears throat> Very much. Well, you guys as well, just because you you're the ones who decided to reach out. Yeah, well, <laughs> thank you. Yes. Talk about uh being brave and going out of your comfort zone. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Oh, well, and th- sometimes that is also the aspect with mental health and the standpoint of your comfort zone, or at least what you think is your comfort zone, may not be the healthy comfort zone. Oh boy, there, there. That's a yeah, that's a can of worms there, but it's so true. Um, mm-hmm. I, uh, I'm trying to think of how I want it, what I want to say, but like I, I've known that my whole life, and I've always, I've always 
I've always been one of those like people who weirdly like has been okay going out of my comfort zone because like no one in my family ever left home mm-hmm. really. Um, and like, and so my going away to college and my, I lived in Japan for a couple of years. Like I did a lot mm-hmm. of st- stuff that like everybody in my family, like my immediate family was like, Whoa, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Um, so I've, and I've always been kind of like, okay with that kind of stuff. But one thing I will say um, is ever since COVID um, and like that sort of like, like really long period of time, just kind of home and hunkered down and like mm-hmm. kind of isolated my, my, um, bravery has taken a hit. Mm. Um, I found that like, I've gotten very comfortable being a homebody, very comfortable just sitting around doing absolutely nothing. And then that compounded with grief Mm -hmm. um which has taken an insane toll um way bigger toll than i ever would have imagined um and like i just i became a very different person um Mm -hmm. in the last like year and so like only just in like the last maybe couple of months have i felt myself like slowly like climb my way out Mm -hmm. of this like sort of very sad bubble I've created for myself, you know, Mm -hmm. just to be perfectly honest. Um, Mm -hmm. um, So yeah, I I think I would say that like grief and comfort zone and stuff like they, they fight. (laughs) Grief wants me to stay very low and very um, sad and sort of like keep myself safe. Mm -hmm. And, but like my career and my, pursuits demand that I don't do that. So mm-hmm. like it's a lot mm-hmm. of, I'm, I'm at ends with myself. a lot. <laughs> well, given everything that's, I know recently happened with Abbott elementary, I'd say there's a demon you could probably in, in, add to the show around there as well. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we have, <laughs> we have a list because <laughs> as I mentioned to you, like we're really mm-hmm. trying to, um, we're trying to incorporate more world mythology. Mm. Um, <clears throat> my husband, Tim, is a an encyclopedia of like Greek uh, mm. myth. Um, kind of like, you're just like, how do you know that? <laughs> um, but, uh, but I mean, but we're trying to incorporate as much as we can and I kind of get out of the vampire werewolf um, Mm -hmm. duality of genre. (laughs) That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Or zombies even like, I mean, I love all those things. Don't get me wrong, but like, there's so much more to play with. Yeah. Um, Highly overused. Uh, It may just be the fact there's there's it some way is simpler and depending on what the uh, visual effects people and prosthetics mm -hmm. easier to do those than trying to say craft a minotaur horn. Yeah, yeah, Minotaur would definitely be tough, but I mean, oh, how fun would it be, though? <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, I can just imagine some of the other jokes that come up from that as well. Mm. Yes. Yeah, Theseus and the Minotaur takes on a whole new meaning um, when, mm-hmm. when you put it through the lens of Demon Hunter. Um. <laughs> well, even to, even as LGBT, it's like that takes on a very different tone, too. Sure does. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yes, there is a lot of that. Um, but yeah, no, I, uh, yeah. uh, In order to make anything happen and it's, I know it's like a hard thing to think of, especially when you're battling mental health, which I think most people are having some sort of mental health battle, especially Mm -hmm. since COVID. I mean, it's hard to, I feel like, I I feel like it's impossible that somebody has gotten through all of this unscathed Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, in some capacity. Right. Um, but you know, pushing through a, a business like this and an industry like this, where it requires so much of you and to be able to handle so much rejection and so much, just so much failure, but, you know, and like being able to like pick yourself back up and do it again, pick yourself back up and like, just keep going. Like it's, it, it's tough, but like, mm-hmm. I think, I mean, I wouldn't, I would never want to, you know, paint it as anything other than like, it's challenging. It truly is. So that's why, you know, when, people ask like, how do you, how do you like make it? Which I mean, I wouldn't even consider myself in the place of having made it yet, quote, you know, mm-hmm. quote, unquote. but like, it's like, you have to love it a, like a lot to the point where you really want to do it over anything else. And you really have to build yourself a support of not like a financial support. Like you have mm-hmm. to have work that pays you enough to survive that you can handle doing that doesn't like 
make you want to tear your eyes out. Mm-hmm. You have to build a, a, a network of support people um, mm-hmm. that support you and you support them and you, you have a community that you can fall back on. Um, and, and because people always ask like, where should I live? Do I need to move to LA? No, you need to live somewhere that you like living. <laughs> you don't like in this day and age, you do not have to live here to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, to a degree, you may have to at some point, but if you're just getting started and you're a filmmaker, you can live in any, pretty much anywhere, make something. So live somewhere you like, build up your, you know, <laughs> build up your portfolio a little bit, build up your experience, build up your funds, then start thinking about, you know, if you want to go to a major hub. But that's always kind of my, my, what I tell people if people ask me like what to do. Um, and I am by no means an expert, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that is a well put sentiment and things for people to consider. And I think that's a good, great place for us to go and take a break. So we're going to take a break here and come back for the second half. I'm Perry Clark, licensed marriage and family therapist here with actor Robert Rice. So stay tuned and we'll talk with you more soon. Our lives and the world around us can get messy and frustrating. Untangle and Grow Counseling's focus is to untangle that mess and make sense of it so you have a good foundation to build and grow from. Visit us on the web at untangleandgrowcounseling.com. Perry Clark offers individual psychotherapy, couples and family therapy, and adolescence therapy from a variety of coping materials and resources. Visit untangleandgrowcounseling.com for more information. You are listening to Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered. If you have a question or comment about our podcast, send an email to pclark at untyingknotspodcast.com. That's pclark at untyingknotspodcast.com. And now, back to the program. Hello, all. Welcome back to Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered. I'm Perry Clark, licensed marriage and family therapist here with actor Robert Rice. So we've been, we had met each other uh, recently doing a panel at San Diego Comic-Con on neurodiversity and LGBT support. And we have been talking about your series, Demon Hunters. And I should also say that's Demon Hunters without the second E. Yes. In the spelling of it. So if you're looking for it online, drop the second E in Hunter. Mm-hmm. That would be in Hunter. Um, as well as what we were talking about in the panel. And one of the other people that I know I'm going to be talking to in the future is Natasha Lee. And she brought up a very interesting point uh, during the panel about the aspect of sexuality. Yeah. And yeah. as I was watching Demon Hunter, I was very much, very much aware of the switch around the aspect of nudity and who's being seen because i mean classically as if you watch any number of mass produced and for depending on how what century uh women are often the characters that are seen the most unclothed Mm -hmm. and as i'm watching this one it's like well i'm seeing a lot more of the women clothed and a lot more of the men unclothed Yeah, we did that on purpose. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, especially, I mean, you're right. It's basically any form of media, but horror especially has, mm-hmm. you know, always historically exploited women. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> you know, they're topless getting chopped up by some sort of murderer or something, you know, running mm-hmm. with their boobs out. And it's just, it is what it is, um, mm-hmm. you know. Running around in the lingerie or someone's having yeah. that really long shower scene and, Oh, or yes, yes, yes. Jason or Michael or somebody comes in and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're always, it's always a lot of naked women getting murdered <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> or just being naked for the sake of being naked. Mm-hmm. Um, and so with Demon Hunter, I mean, obviously we're, we're gay, we're gay men and we're, we're, this is made for a queer audience. But what I think people may not realize is we, we specifically made a choice to have absolutely no female nudity. Um, mm-hmm. And not just because we're like, mm, we're gay. We don't know. No. That was a deliberate choice. Um, and men would have, uh, would be exploited. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, obviously like the actors were not exploited. Everything was done very safely. Um, we had intimacy coordinated, you know, intimacy coordination, like everybody, there was consent. Like 
in the final product, it's a, it, there's a little bit of an exploitation of it, but like in the actual filming of it, there was, it was done as safely as like a fight scene would be done, mm-hmm. um, you know, and people provided robes and it was a close set. Like it was very, very tastefully and like safely done. Mm-hmm. But we were deliberate in having a lot of male nudity and frontal nudity because it's just sort of like our way of saying, hey, like this is sort of like what you do to women, <laughs> but it's a lot of men. And the thing is, like to this day, a penis is shocking on mm-hmm. film. Mm-hmm. Like it's still shocking. And it's like we all have one. Like, I mean, <laughs> if you know what I mean, not we, not everybody mm-hmm. in the world has one, mm-hmm. but like mm-hmm. half the population give or take has one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. And, and it's like, mm-hmm. but you never, you never see it. Right. But you mm-hmm. always see boobs. You always see, you know, like women exploited. So we're like, we're just going to do this. Um, and that has actually been like a, an interesting thing because um, people watch it and they're kind of like shocked at first, even mm-hmm. people, even gay people, gay mm-hmm. men are shocked. Like, Oh my God, I never expected to see so many pics. I'm like, <laughs> you've probably seen more in real life, (laughs) but, Mm. you know, but I think what it is, is like, it's just like, we sort of like this, once you get past the shock of it, Mm -hmm. it's like, they're just, it's just people naked. They Mm -hmm. all have naked bodies. Right. And like, there is, there is a lot of sex, but there's also a lot of just nudity. Um, Mm -hmm. And the thing is like, and it's just there. And like, it, it, it tends to serve a purpose. Like it tends to be a reason somebody is naked. People aren't just naked. Um, like there is no random shower scene. Like there is mm-hmm. a shower scene in the first episode, but like you find out why that's happening or like mm-hmm. what is happening pretty quickly. Right. Um, but yeah, that's basically what we were going for. It's just sort of like, what if we put that pendulum all the way in the other direction and just like mm-hmm. kind of do a little male exploitation? Um, you know, it is obviously through the queer lens. So like there is a lot of same sex. Um sex <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. or just like intimacy but um but also there's just nudity mm-hmm. um and you know it, it's definitely i think one of the reasons I, we got attention um and we get eyeballs on it but that's not the only reason we did it we were making right. a little bit of a statement so <laughs> right which also adds into that standpoint of the issue of the hypersexuality right too and, and where does that also play in the tropes of horror Totally. Like if, you know, um, in, in basically all horror, like the, the hypersexual characters die. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, obviously traditionally it's women, mm-hmm. um, but men too. And, and queer characters who are hypersexual in, in a lot of projects die as well. They, mm-hmm. die, they basically, everybody has to pay for their sexuality. Like it, mm-hmm. it's, it's a very odd thing that is built into so much cinema. Um, so that was the other thing is that we were going for is this like a very sex positive approach. And, and I would definitely say demon hunters on the hypersexual side, but the thing is like, it's always viewed through the lens of like acceptance and positivity. Like Mm -hmm. not every character is having sex with everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, but the characters who are, um, uh, very, um, open to sex, we'll put it that way. Sex positive, like nobody is shaming them for that. It's always a very positive thing in terms of the way it's received and the way it's given to you know given mm-hmm. out mm-hmm. and like even the, there's like a little bit of a like in a, a situation with exes where um like they have some difficulty being together but it's like mm-hmm. there's even like a whole thing about that where it's like not about the fact that like one of them is a little more hoey <laughs> for lack mm-hmm. of a better word promiscuous it has more to do with the fact that they have like kind of different like abilities and one allows one is able to like read the other's mind which is like kind mm-hmm. of a violation of like privacy even mm-hmm. if it's inverted. so the fact that the one is more promiscuous you know doesn't really matter they don't mm-hmm. care um mm-hmm. so like you know that's and that's also a little bit more reflective of queer male relationships mm-hmm. you know like there tends to be a little bit more of a comfort with that you know, like we can have conversations with each other about other men being attractive. Many couples are open, you know, Mm -hmm. like it's just not, it's not unusual. So like, Mm -hmm. that's why we kind of incorporated that. We're like, it's, this is the norm for us, you know, and there are lots of different relationships in Demon Hunter. There's a lot of people who do, you know, who act differently, who have different desires, different sexual desires, different romantic desires. But like, Mm -hmm. you know, we wanted everything to be viewed through the, through the lens of acceptance. Mm -hmm. You know, there's mm-hmm. no, there's no shaming. Right. 
which was a topic of our uh, topic I was talking a lot during our panel about and yeah. how much that gets played into this um, mm -hmm. equally. And I know that's also one that we're, you have to sit balance with everything that's going on in the world right now with a certain, shall we say, pox that's going around and the stigma that's getting caught up and shall we say revisiting old stigmas that mm -hmm. have gone on with that too. Um, as I was talking to friends last night, I, and I hated having to make this association. There's a way that as LGBT people, we're kind of like the canaries in the mine. Mm -hmm. If there's going to be a disease that comes up, yeah, we'll hit it first, but that means we're giving warning for everybody else because yeah. disease does not stop with just one group. No. And I mean, like I, you know, I've been talking to my dad about it and I'm mm -hmm. like, and he, my dad is very, he's actually very good about like, mm -hmm. you know, getting vaccines and getting stuff, you know, getting what he needs when he needs it health wise. And I told him, I'm like, look, just ask your doctor about the monkeypox vaccine. I'm like, I know you're not, you know, quote unquote in the demographic that's like at risk right now, blah, blah, blah. But, mm -hmm. um, but it's going to have, it's going to come <laughs> mm -hmm. and, you know, you should protect yourself. And he went to his doctor and he asked about it. And the doctor laughed in his face. Of course. And there's the stigma. Yeah. And he's like, what are you worried about it for? And I was like, oh my God, my dad is in his late seventies. He's still social. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and now he's a, he's a widower. So like he's mm -hmm. trying to be social again. Um, I'm like, <laughs> and the doctor just laughed. Like, it's just, it's disgusting, you know? Um, but what's going to happen is, we're all going to get the vaccine <laughs> mm -hmm. because we're like, yeah, I'm going to get the vaccine. Um, and then we're going to, kids are going to go back to school and then we're going to find ourselves in a whole new situation. Another, another pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, <clears throat> <laughs> which I'm certain we could do as a theme for demon hunters. <sighs> to, well, I will say like, we're, we're having sort of that pandemic as a theme fatigue, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, it's just Not like, it's, it's obviously like the, what's on everyone's mind, but it's also like, Oh God, how many more things about pandemics can we possibly do right now? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which will be interesting to see how any other movies or, and materials that are coming out in the next say five years, how much they will actually involve a pandemic as a mechanism. I mean, even the most recent um, Netflix Resident Evil attempt, the T virus is ultimately a pandemic. It is. That is true. I was just thinking my dad, like he watches all like the network procedurals and stuff. Mm -hmm. So like during the pandemic, I mean, I didn't get to visit them much. I mean, I don't think I visited them at all until we were all vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember watching bull on cbs mm -hmm. with them because they like that show and like ever there's glass partitions in the show everyone's wearing a mask in the show so in mm -hmm. universe they made it COVID. Mm -hmm. um and i just found myself watching that like uh <laughs> like well, we watch to escape <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's like i get it i understand mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah i think somebody was uh i think it was on twitter i was watching reading something and basically said the person was reading a book and it, but the book was written like five, 10 years ago or early 2000s. And the, they were saying they were kept expecting the author to talk about pan, the mm -hmm. pandemic when this was written, the pandemic was even an idea. And that sort of dichotomy between what we're seeing in fiction, what we're seeing in reality and the expectations for it to show up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <sighs> It's a little bit of a damned if you do, damned if you don't thing, or it has been. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. know how things will go moving forward because, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people don't want to see it. They don't want to think about it. They want to escape. Mm -hmm. Other people are like, but it's real and it's what hap it's happening. And if you're setting something contemporary, you can't just ignore it. Because mm -hmm. it's had an impact on things. <laughs> right. So, I, I mean, that's why we, we stick to genre and stuff that has at least a small element of fantasy because then you can just extend that mm -hmm. fantasy to there's no pandemic <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. gotcha well i think we're at that point in the show where it's now time for our myths and realities so what would you uh, say as someone of the myths you know about hear about think about when it comes to the subject of mental health mm. well the biggest one that i've dealt with in the last year is i think and i and i, I think even the person who who founded this idea agrees at this point is the stages of grief are 
Bay myth. I mean, they're, they, they came around to diagnose, not to diagnose, but to sort of like understand mm-hmm. the, the thought process of somebody who was diagnosed with mm-hmm. um, a terminal illness. Right? right. So like that, all of that is for so that person who's dealing with their own mortality, mm-hmm. but they have been universally applied to bereaved people. And mm-hmm. when you're, when you're mourning a loss, you don't go through the same stages mm-hmm. and, and you certainly don't go through them in order. And you certainly mm-hmm. don't go through them all in like a certain amount of time. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I can sometimes go through all five in a day and then the next day be right back at one, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know? Um, mm-hmm. So that's been my biggest sort of like Big rock on since then. Cause I'm just like, you know, I've even had like conversations with a therapist who was just like, well, where, you know, where do you think you are? I'm like, it's not, applicable <laughs> like it's just not um <clears throat> so that's really my big one like yeah yeah i usually when i talk about it i i don't talk about stages i usually talk about the cycle because mm-hmm. you're going to constantly keep repeating it the real question yeah. is what's the intervals mm-hmm. between them and how much is each one like you grief um the denial might be two or three hours while the anger phase, maybe 10 minutes. Yeah, exactly. And the exactly. bargaining could be the next six hours. The acceptance is when you're finally going to bed that night. Mm-hmm. And like I said, it starts back at one, but I guess one might be the anger next one. So treating it like a cycle, it's how many other days between before the cycle restarts or yeah. you, it's something that reminds you about what you were grieving about in the first place. That's precisely it. Yeah. And it's always you're very much in confronted with these cycles, especially in the first year. Yeah. Yeah. And that this past Saturday was the one year mark for me. Um, <clears throat> so it's very here. recent. What? Oh, I got a little lag here because you were saying oh. the, this past Saturday and then it stopped. Oh, this past Saturday was my one year mark. Uh-huh. for my mother's passing. So like, I, I know I acutely am aware <laughs> mm-hmm. of what that first year is like, um, and just how kind of all over the place, mm-hmm. um, it, which, I mean, that's really the biggest myth, but the other thing that I would say that, um, r- regarding grief is like that I didn't know that I learned going through a parental loss is mm-hmm. like when I imagined, grief, I always mm-hmm. imagined it as like, Oh, I'm very sad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and obviously that is true. Um, but what I didn't expect was the amount of physical side effects I would experience mm-hmm. and sort of mental, like, like brain fog, memory loss, like focus issues, just like exhaustion. Like it, the way it affected my body was way beyond what I ever would have imagined. Mm-hmm. Um, especially in the first like four to six months. Like there would just be days I would like walk out of the room and be like, what am I doing? I don't know what I'm doing. Did I just do, you know what I mean? Like it just, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and I'm still in my thirties. So like, I don't think I have any other reason for memory loss yet. Um, so like, it really was, it was intense. So like mm-hmm. if I mean, I've had, I posted about it on, you know, over the weekend, because like, again, I was at the year mark and I had a lot of people chime in and say, yeah, I experienced that same thing. Like I just never expected like, my whole body to shut down. I'm like, yes, that's exactly mm-hmm, what happens. <laughs> mm-hmm. So like, it's definitely like, if you're, if you're going through, if you're grieving something, if you're having, dealing with a personal loss, you who's listening, um, like, and you're experiencing that stuff, that's most likely why <laughs> mm-hmm. it's not, mm-hmm. you know, you're not, you're not crazy. <laughs> like it's, it's real. It's a real effect. Um, yeah. And we're in many ways also dealing with it on a, what would say is a macro worldwide scale with everything that's happened with, both the pan- yeah. with the pandemic and the aspect of how many people are still in denial, how many mm-hmm. people are still in the angry stage, how many are trying to bargain their way out of it. Yeah. Just ignore it. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, yeah. That there are mm-hmm. still people I know who still don't believe in it. Mm-hmm. Like don't even believe that it's real after all this. I'm just like, wow. Yeah. Can I have some of what you're having? Because it sounds a lot nicer. Nicer, but you know, might be the best thing to keep keep some degree of distance. Because yeah, you know, they're the ones who don't decide that they didn't. There's nothing wrong after the zombie bite. 
Yeah, you're right. You're right. They're the most dangerous people. They're like, no, I'm fine. Nothing happened. I'm going to just come in. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then they're in your house. (laughs) Exactly. Well, I think that's a lovely place for you to tell people where they can find more Demon Hunter. Yes. If you would like to enjoy a fun horror comedy that's super queer and diverse and just kind of a, just a good time. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Demon Hunter, uh, singular uh spell the hunter is spelled kind of like grinder or tinder so Mm -hmm. d-e-m-o-n-h-u-n-t-r um you can if you google it you'll find it but you can watch it on here tv or amazon prime at the moment i believe it it's also available on video on demand services like um like apple and all Mm -hmm. that um but for now i know for certain you uh, can see it on uh, amazon prime and here tv and you can honestly watch the whole thing in an evening it's about the same length as a film so you can get the free trial watch it enjoy Mm -hmm. leave a review (laughs) (laughs) uh and yeah please enjoy please let us know how you how you like it if you watch it um where i think we're on twitter and instagram and all that under demon hunter either demon hunter show or demon hunter series I can send the specifics to Perry and maybe you can include that in the show notes. Yeah, definitely. Happy to. So I want to thank you for the time you've taken to be here and my thank grilling you. and such and sharing some of these realities that I think people don't realize, but people also there are also those of us that would enjoy it. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I appreciate you um, inviting me. It was really great. Yeah, you're welcome. So tune in next time, folks, as we're going to be talking with some, a few more of the people that I met during Comic-Con and uh, we'll go from there. So you be well and hopefully have a good Halloween as this should be airing in October. Okay. (laughs) Here on Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered on Voice America Network. Thank you for tuning in for Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered. Be sure to join your host, Perry Clark, for another episode on the podcast coming soon on the Voice America Empowerment Channel.